Hello and welcome to today's lecture and we're continuing the theme of tragedy that we uh, picked up looking at Aristotle last time and we're going to be looking at Schopenhauer today, Arthur Schopenhauer, a German philosopher born 1788 and died 1860, a very kind of turbulent time in, in Europe um, and Schopenhauer was a, an influ a very influential thinker at this time um, and, and wrote a book when he was very young called The World as Will and Representation, uh, which was a very influential book and sort of established his reputation and set out a interesting and novel theory of art, including a theory of tragedy that we're going to look at um, in this lecture today. So we'll be digging into Schopenhauer's philosophy and looking at some of his um, influences, and we'll be taking a look at his theory of tragedy, which revolves around his analysis of what's called the sublime, uh, which goes back to early modern thinking and um, people like Immanuel Kant and English philosopher Edmund Burke, um, who called it a kind of delightful terror, all had these readings of, of the sublime. Um, and Schopenhauer is picking up on that and he's going to give us his own theory, which will be kind of illuminating um, for thinking about tragedy and thinking about how how we derive pleasure and satisfaction from watching tragedy. All right, so let's talk about a couple of major influences on Schopenhauer. And the first is a philosopher we've touched on before, um, called Immanuel Kant. And his theory of transcendental idealism um, was a huge influence on Schopenhauer and indeed on all of German philosophy that came after Kant was influenced by this idea. Um, and part of this idea, the theory that space and time and the logical features of the world, such as cause and effect, um, all those features are, are the construction of our minds. Um, they're they're the, the work of how our mind helps to co-construct reality um, along with what's given to us from our senses, from our sense impressions. So that's that's called Kant's transcendental idealism, um, that the world is is in part a construction of, of our minds and that constructive work helps to form and shape um, the spatial, the temporal and the logical features of, of the world we see. Um, so other thinkers took this in in, in different directions. Um, there was a, there was a growth and a flowering of idealism after Kant's death, and Schopenhauer is sort of writing at the back end of this, really, when when Kant's influence is is at its height, but also uh, it sort of beginning um, begins to wane, although it picks up in a scientific sense in the mid nineteenth century. Um, but this idea, this notion of, of idealism that, that the world is a is is in part a representation. Um, some thinkers like Schopenhauer after Kant made this more more robust and in Schopenhauer we'll see that idea that that the world itself is a kind of construction or a kind of representation of our minds. Now Kant was also influential in the areas of, of morality or ethics or moral theory um, and aesthetics or the theory of art as well. And all of these influences persisted after Kant's death and Schopenhauer um, exhibits quite a, a strong influence in these areas as well. Kant argued that moral action exhibits the contrast between our sensible or material and our super sensible being. So it reveals our longing to a reality beyond nature. Um, and that kind of that contrast between nature, which is all about inclination, as Kant calls it, impulse and inclination, and the super sensible reality where we can understand um, and apply moral judgments. That's a fundamental split for Kant between material nature and our super sensible being, which sort of harkens to, to a beyond and the divine and so on in Kant's thought. In aesthetics, as we'll see, Schopenhauer was largely influenced by Kant's theory of disinterestedness, which he develops in the critique of judgment. And so this theory had a, had a very strong effect on theories of art, and we'll take a look at how that idea influenced Schopenhauer today. <laughs> 
So the second major influence on Schopenhauer is Buddhism. And he's one of the one of the first to really bring Eastern thinkers in a substantive way into modern Western philosophy. And he's, he's influenced in particular by this contrast in Buddhism between the world of desire, the world of craving, the everyday world we live in, um, and the potential release from this addiction through meditation, through discipline, meditation and yoga and enlightenment. So that contrast, of course, for, for Schopenhauer is, is it's going to figure in a similar way to the contrast that Kant draws between our sort of material world and our, our world of sort of inclinations and desires and the super sensible reality that we're opened up to in, in morality and moral thinking. And, and Schopenhauer is going to copy that, um, is going to see the same pattern in this, in, this, in this Buddhist sort of opposition between desire and craving and the potential release through enlightenment. So Schopenhauer refers to this idea of viewing the world after, after lifting the veil um, he calls the veil of Maya, th this idea of lifting the veil of Maya. And that's a that's an idea in, in Buddhism that we see the world ordinarily through our desires and cravings. So it's sort of individualized in terms of what we're attracted to. Things are sort of picked out and everything is sort of split up and individualized in according to how it attracts us. Um, that's life behind the veil of Maya. When we release the veil, when we when we lift the veil and we see reality as it really is, <coughs> then we get a sense of the fundamental oneness of everything, the sort of oneness and unity. So that's sort of a, a, a glimpse of things behind the veil of Maya. So that sort of opposition um, is going to be very important when we look at Schopenhauer's theory of tragedy and why tragedy can sort of, as we'll see, it's almost like tragedy can have a a similar effect in releasing us from this from this world of addiction, this world of craving and sort of lifting us up to the glimpse of, a, of an alternative reality that we can get through this kind of um, this enlightenment or through this um, aesthetic experience of tragedy. So the essential point in Schopenhauer's The World as Will and Representation, the the stance with which he opens that book is that the essence of the world is will. And the essential point there is a pessimistic one, right? Life is suffering because it's fundamentally a clash of, of wills. And we can, you know, the, that's was taken up in the 19th century in this idea of a struggle for self-preservation. Each species and the, each member of the species is struggling against other, other species and trying to survive and trying to perpetuate itself. Um, and so it's it's a sort of zero com sum conflict. One survives, one um, you know one one other creature dies. So it's so life is this sort of clash of wills. Um, so <coughs> for Schopenhauer, it works like this: that in in desiring in our cravings, we're we're looking for a satisfaction, but every happiness or satisfaction is only a temporary relief from suffering followed by um, a situation or a state of boredom. So it, it looks like we're fulfilling our desires, but that doesn't lead to happiness. Um, that leads to a kind of temporary relief that's again, followed by sort of lethargy and boredom. Um, you know, sort of after a wild, um, a wild animal has sort of chased and killed its prey um, and then sort of taken its meal the first thing it does when it's satisfied is it takes a big long nap um, <clears throat> and that's kind of a model for what Schopenhauer thinks about about human sort of satisfaction and stuff that it's it's a sort of it's a momentary release from suffering followed by um, boredom so it, it doesn't bring us satisfaction um, it doesn't bring us real happiness now the theories of, of the world uh, the theory of the world is will and the influences of Kant and Buddhism really come together in Schopenhauer's theory of art. And like I said, that's really the centerpiece of his of his of his book on the world as will and representation. And art features as a kind of release from suffering, similar to the way that in Buddhism, Nirvana is a release from the cycle of cravings. So art is a kind of um, a kind of release, a kind of salvation almost from suffering. 
so this this obviously puts a large um puts a large burden on art to be able to to fulfill these feelings to fulfill these expectations um so we'll have to take a look at how schopenhauer conceives that art is able to to take on this task which is um you know looks like a, a really um a really significant and important task so the basic idea of the world as will for schopenhauer is that the world is not revealed to us as it is in itself right and again that comes from kant we don't see the world as it really is we see it as filtered through the constructive work of our mind so for schopenhauer it's revealed to us through our interests and desires right so things stand out for us they appear to us as interesting as worthy based on how they engage our interests and desires right so when we look at the world we're not looking neutrally and just observing things neutrally we're picking out things things are standing out from the background based on how they interest us based on their relation to our desires right and that that's and that's that's the way we kind of engage with with the world and it's like looking at the world behind a, a pair of of rose tinted or pink tinted sunglasses right where everything we see is tinted with this particular shade and the shading comes from how our interests and desires inform the things we see right so that's that's the world we see we're not seeing the world as it is we're not contemplating things as they are we're seeing the world as it's filtered through our desires and interests picking out things that interest us picking out things that are of concern to us letting those things stand out in particular ways that appeal to our desires now this is where the idea of disinterestedness comes in and as i said this comes from kant's theory of art right the basic idea is that in art we are able to get beyond the standpoint of the will we're able to get beyond this this filter where we see things through our cravings we, we're able to see the world in art as it is without our interests and desires and we can therefore contemplate its meaning so one way to think about this right when we look at a still life or a, a nature mort as it's called in french this idea this it's just a painting of fruit sometimes they're on a bowl sometimes they're in a basket um but it, it's often a, a, a sort of painting of a bowl of fruit as a sort of typical a typical still life painting right now <clears throat> it seems like a, a trivial question but it's really quite important for us to ask um so how does the idea of of standing before and looking at a at a painting of a bowl of fruit how does that differ from looking at an actual bowl of fruit right well when we look at a real bowl of fruit um it's quite possible that our, our desires will be triggered right um if the fruit looks very juicy if it smells smells very fruity we can get a sense of how tasty it's going to be right so a real bowl of fruit sort of is going to interest our desires it, it might trigger some of our desires in certain ways our sense of smell our sense of taste um all these things could be kind of um could be kind of turned on by what we're seeing so here's the thing here's i think a good way to understand disinterestedness that when we're looking at a painting right and we're looking at a, a still life of a bowl of fruit all those interests in the thing itself in the existence of the thing itself all those interests are bracketed or put aside right so instead of looking at the fruit and thinking wow that looks tasty when we look at a, a painting of a bowl of fruit we're looking at the surface appearance features and we're looking at how those those appearance features um how they stand in space how they present the solidity of, of the object right we're looking at a painting right we're looking at a flat surface but we're looking at the way that color and surface do all of these interesting things okay so that's part of what what i'm talking about when i say when we see the world as it when we see the world without our interests and desires and i'm saying we have that possibility in the world of art when we see things disinterestedly when we do that we can contemplate the world's meaning 
right? So without engaging our desires, we look at things just as they are, right? We see the bowl of fruit when it's painted, when it's a still life, we see the bowl of fruit as it really is, without that being sort of colored by our desires, by our interest in the real existence of the thing. Okay, so an even starker example of that is arts painting of, of material bodies and arts painting of nudes. And the, the question of, of how, again, there's a sort of suspension of interest or desire that, that we have in material existence, right? So there's this common argument about, about art and, and sort of nude flesh and bodies and things that says, what art is doing is doing something fundamentally different to when we see these nude images that are intended to, to titillate and to sort of um, to engage our desires and our senses, right? Similar to a bowl of fruit, when we see a painted nude, right? We those desires are not triggered in the same way, right? Instead, we're able to sort of almost calmly contemplate the meaning of the thing. We're able to explore the sense of its appearance, the shape, um, the shape of this body, how the flesh sits. So all of these things can be done in a sort of contemplative attitude in a way that, again, doesn't sort of launch the desires, um, the desires that we otherwise have in material flesh. So we can say that art brackets or suspends that interest or desire and allows us to see things as they really are. And again, this is a this is fundamentally the kind of Kantian idea of disinterestedness. And I think Schopenhauer, in taking this up, um, you know, he is going to take this in an interesting way. But this is the basic idea that that we're talking about here, the idea of contemplating things without interest. That's what Kant means by disinterestedness. Another nice example on this comes from um, the reading chapter nine that the world shows up in everyday practical consciousness in the way in which a beautiful landscape shows up on the general's plan of a battlefield, right? So in, in the plan, in the battlefield plan, every feature of the landscape is instrumentalized. It's made dependent on its role in, in, in the sort of battlefield strategy, right? So trees, which otherwise become places for us to look at, places for us to sit under and seek shade, trees become places of camouflage, right? Hills become sort of obstacles instead of um, places for an afternoon walk and a place to take in the, take in the landscape. Um, so everything derives its meaning from the way it shows up on the general sort of strategic battlefield. Things only show up as interested in this way, right? So if we compare that to say a painting of the landscape Right, a painting of the landscape is going to show us the natural features, how they, how they sort of engage our contemplation. Um, here, instead, everything is sort of turned into something that triggers our interest, you know, which is which is here sort of guided by the idea of battle and strategy. So this is kind of a a good way of thinking about that contrast here. Here, the world is completely interested, right? It's completely shot through with our interest and desire. Um, so it's it's the opposite of sort of seeing things in a disinterested way. All right, in this incredible phrase from uh, the world as well, Schopenhauer says, in art, we are delivered from the miserable premise of the will. We celebrate the Sabbath of the penal servitude of willing. The wheel of Ixion stands still. And you see the wheel of Ixion here represented in in Greek um, uh, sculpture and pottery. And it's it's a sort of wheel of fire that spins and spins around constantly. Um, Ixion tried to seduce Zeus's wife um, and Zeus kind of cast him out with a thunderbolt and decreed that he be cast to this wheel and spinning for eternity. Um, so that's sort of Schopenhauer's metaphor for human life, right? It's this continual this continual torture of, you know, pointless spinning that's not going anywhere, um, pointless sort of painful spinning around on the spot. So in art, it's as though that sort of that misery and that suffering is is made still for a moment, right? It doesn't it doesn't end it, it doesn't stop it, but we're able to sort of 
we're able to see clear of it for, for a moment. For a moment, it stops still and we can see what's happening. Right, we can sort of contemplate the reality and the truth of everything that's happening um, and also see ourselves as not not entirely part of that of that sort of miserable continuous spinning. OK, so let's let's sort of spell this out in more detail. So we need to look at Kant's account of the sublime in order to really, really dig this out. So there, there are two kinds of the sublime that Kant talks about in the third critique. The first is the mathematical sublime. And the mathematical sublime is infinite extension, which reminds us of our vanishing nothingness in contrast with the vastness of space and time. A good image for that is the, the pyramids, right? Standing in front of the pyramids, we feel a sense of this sort of vastness of this of this construction that is simply mind boggling how this thing was able to be constructed with primitive technology and so on and so on. Um, so so when we stand before these massive structures, we get a sense of our own sort of vanishing insignificance and nothingness. Um, so that's the math. That's the mathematical sublime, this sense of our smallness and insignificantness in relation with these sort of with the massiveness of space and time. The second example, the dynamic sublime, this reminds us of our causal puniness in comparison with the gigantic power inherent in forces of nature. So the typical way of thinking of the dynamic sublime is in sort of <coughs> confronting or sort of seeing um, a raging storm and, and we're sort of, you know, close to a cliff edge and we see the storm raging and we sense this sort of enormous power that could blow us off our feet, that could pull us in, that could that could destroy us very easily. So that's that's the sort of sense of our puniness faced with the power of the of the forces of nature. So here again, we sense our smallness, our insignificantness, but here it's the power of nature rather than it's sort of its size that's doing, um, that's sort of making us small. All right, so Schopenhauer makes three specific claims about the sublime, and he's gonna pick up on Kant's view um, in some important respects. The object of contemplation stands say Schopenhauer in a hostile relation to the will. It is threatening and terrible, right? So that's when we see these sort of, these incidents of suffering, these um, these incidents of, of, uh, of pain and um, horrible things that are happening in human life. The kind of, you know, the turning of the wheel of Ixion as Schopenhauer represents it. The subject is aware of this hostile relation. Um, in other words, the subject is aware of a kind of of a difference, of a disjunction, a lack of identity between um, the, the, the object that it's contemplating and its relation to itself, right? That they're not quite the same thing. Yet the subject is able to contemplate calmly and as pure will-less subject, those very objects that are terrible and threatening, right? So that's the key point that the subject is, is able to experience, to have this experience of calm, detached contemplation in relation to these things that are terrible and threatening. For example, the things that happen in a tragedy. Um, so that's the that's the kind of uh, uh, the kind of the, the willless relationship to terrible things. And again, that's that's how he's going to build in this idea similar to Schopenhauer, of a, um, sorry, similar to, to Buddhism, of a kind of temporary enlightenment um, in relation to the, um, to the kind of continual striving and craving of life. So how is it possible, Schopenhauer asks, for us to take pleasure and delight in an experience that is also dark and frightening? This is the paradox of tragic pleasure. How can we enjoy something that is frightening? How can something that is scary, frightening, and deals with terrible things, how can that appeal to us? How can we want to enjoy that? How can we derive satisfaction and meaning from that? So that's that's often called the paradox of tragic pleasure. 
right? And if we're going to explain and make sense of tragedy, we have to make sense of that that idea that, that there's an enjoyment and a maybe even a sense of learning here. And how do we make sense of that? So for Schopenhauer, this is worked out through this idea of the sublime. So the sublime reveals to us this fundamental split in our consciousness. We experience this fear of annihilation of our physical being, right? So we experience this fear that our physical being is, is threatened, that it's under threat, that it's, it's at risk. But at the same time, we experience ourselves as different from that physical reality. Right. So it's a, it's it's the duality of the experience, the sense of possible physical threat. Um, the, remember, that's part of Kant's idea of the sublime as well. That sense of our complete physical insignificance um, and our powerlessness. So we sense that whatever happens to our empirical or bodily selves, we cannot be touched or harmed. Right. So that experience of being completely safe in relation to you. To this sense of bodily threat is what sets up the arguments and the idea of the sublime, the idea of this insight that takes us beyond um, this world of suffering. So for Schopenhauer, tragedy is the summit of the poetic art, and it should be pretty clear from what we've been talking about uh, why that should be, why tragedy is the, is the most important art. Its purpose, he says, is the description of the terrible side of life, the unspeakable pain, the wretchedness and misery of mankind, the triumph of wickedness, the scornful mastery of chance, and the irresistible fall of the just and the innocent. Right, so tragedy shows us all these terrible things um, and shows us this side, sort of terrible side of life, but it doesn't leave us there, right? It sort of lifts us up to the, it gives us this sublime experience that enables us to sense um, the possibility of, of a of a beyond of a of a sort of self that wouldn't be part of this world of suffering. Tragedy for Schopenhauer is the highest degree of the feeling of the sublime. Right? It's that it's that moment where we can sort of contemplate this world of suffering, but somehow sense ourselves as not part of it. We're almost it's almost like we're particip we're spectators rather than participants. When we have this feeling of the sublime, we feel that everything's happening, but it doesn't it doesn't touch or affect us. So Schopenhauer sums um, all of this up with this rather interesting quote. So let's let's take a look. He says, "In experiencing through tragedy the awfulness of life." we feel urged to turn away from life, to give up willing and loving life. That's the risk of pessimism, um, of taking the message as one of sort of rejecting and giving up. But precisely in this way, we become aware that there is still left in us something different that we cannot possibly know positively, but only negatively as that which does not will life. Just as the chord of the seventh demands the fundamental chord, just as the red color demands green, so every tragedy de demands an existence of an entirely different kind, a different world, the knowledge of which can only be given to us indirectly, as here by such a demand. At the moment of the tragic catastrophe, we become convinced more clearly than ever that life is a bad dream from which we have to awake. So this sums up that that sort of contrast where we we sort of we, we look into this negativity of things and then we we sense this possibility of a contrast of a, this negative possibility as Schopenhauer says of a contrast with something else that is given only directly. It's like a demand rather than a reality, right? It's not like we experience this different life, but it appears as a kind of demand upon us that it must be if we're having this experience. So since the world itself is merely a representation or a dream for Schopenhauer, there must be a dreamer outside the dream. So this is what we become aware of. This is what we sense. We have a premonition of it. This, this super sensible side of our being when we experience tragedy, right? 
again, it's not something we know as a fact because we only sort of sense we only sense it negatively in this negative sense. It's not it's not really here as part of our knowledge. But tragedy gives us this sense, this premonition that that suit the super sensible side of our being is a reality. There's this interesting difference then between Aristotle and Schopenhauer and, and pity and fear and how it clues into a difference in their theories. Aristotle, as we saw, believes that tragedy brings pity and fear into a kind of balance, right? It gets rid of the excess and it makes us able to, 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 to regulate pity and fear in our daily lives, right? They don't become excessively provoked when something happens or able to regulate and have the appropriate dimension of pity and fear. Now for Schopenhauer, it seems a bit different that tragedy is not, tragedy is not about a kind of daily life balance, right? Tragedy is offering a kind of redemption from the world of pity and fear. And the fundamental difference here is their sort of contrasting views of daily life, right? For Aristotle, um, you know, there's daily life is the pursuit of excellence in various different kinds of practice intellectual um, and practical. For Schopenhauer, daily life is this wheel of Ixion that sort of gives us nothing but suffering and um, and pain. And, and it's 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 a completely, um, you know, it, it's a completely um, joyless reality. So that that's really the sense of, of the contrast. What Schopenhauer is looking for in art is a kind of redemption from all that bad stuff. But of course, for Aristotle doesn't really need that redemption because he doesn't see daily life in the same um, kind of ultra negative terms that Schopenhauer does. All right, so let's see what conclusions we can um, make up from today's talk. So we saw that tragedy has a, more of a religious or spiritual purpose for Schopenhauer in contrast to Aristotle's medical ethical interpretation. Right, so it has this, it's almost like a form of salvation, um, almost like a, re a religious form of salvation in relation to this sort of life of suffering um, in contrast to Aristotle's view. Schopenhauer also creatively combines ideas from Kant and Buddhism, as we saw, to develop a theory of art as a release from the world of suffering. So he sort of joins those ideas together to make this sort of this world of craving um, that 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 we need to that we need to find a kind of release from this world. For Buddhism, that's nirvana. For Kant, it's this sort of moral sense of our super sensible being. Um, and for Schopenhauer, it, it's art that plays this role, and it's the, the central important role that Schopenhauer gives to art. And as we've seen to tragedy as the kind of pinnacle of art that is the really for us the interesting part of his theory. So tragedy is the high point of art and art is the human activity for Schopenhauer that can show us a glimpse of salvation.